All right, everybody, recording. So welcome to our last meeting of January, January 30, for the OS development, OSC development team. Here's the link to the presentation of today. What you noticed is that um, I started a page just since the OSC development team page, is, the devlog is getting really long. You want to just, uh, and it takes a bit of time to load that up, just put that on a new page called Current Meeting. So if you go to the wiki, Current Meeting, you'll, you always have the, um, the meeting of the, of the day. So we can basically start new meetings there, and once, once we do the meeting agenda posted there, then we can move it back to the devlog page, but that would just save a lot of people from having to wait all that time to load up the devlog team page. I don't know how, how it is for you guys, but for me it's it's rather slow with the four mag line and it's kinda takes takes a long time. Just a little inefficiency. But we can also hide the on the devlog page, we can hide the old meetings so they're just links and they're not loading up all the, the Google presentations. So um, we can do that in the future. Okay. So agenda for today, let's take a look at I'm gonna share my screen. All right, sharing. Um, yep, we're moving right along. So, so agenda for today would be leaderboard, biodigester, extreme builds, planning for t for this year. We got 3D printer, extruder, power cube. I'm not sure if we've got anything else. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, some D3D Australia. I'll put that in um, in the headings here. Yeah, so uh, first thing, so leaderboard. Hey guys, look at this. Uh, I looked at, uh, so so Lex is doing the tracking of all the the, the platform, OSC Dev platform on the wiki. If you go to OSC, OSC Dev, uh, let's see, what's the, what's the link there? OSC Dev, that's it. OSC Dev documents all the features of the development, the the documentation of, of time logging and, and so forth. And you, you can see there how you can extract the leaderboard. But on the leaderboard, this is the current um, current data. Top 20 of all time. This means one year from now. We started about February 1st of last year, just so just about last same time last year. And over that year, we we logged like 6,000 or so hours. And here's the breakdown. Uh, ignore number one about that's me <laughs> but the second one so actually so actually roberto is in second place with 430 hours michael 371 lex is about 350 there's abe there's um oliver is currently on the team well, no, Oliver and Palomides, they, they are not really active right now. This is uh, this is active current. Yeah, so you can look at these look at these values. But what's that mean? Like a whole twelve week cycle is one hundred twenty hours. So that means completion of a full ninety day cycle, ten hours a week, one hundred twenty hours. So for example, for Roberto, that means he's completed a full three like 360 and then some so full three 90-day cycles just like michael and almost on lex and, and abe and others so yeah that that continues so it's good to keep track like this and hopefully as we move into the future this will be a good record and we're just growing and my biggest hope right now is that by writing the book, we really organize a lot of effort and really put together all the thoughts from literally the last decade of development of all that we've learned and, and, and how we can go forward. And the main concept being modularity, the modular breakdown, the, the granularity of a project that allows people to take on little bite-sized chunks. And that's, that's the secret of uh, this modular design plus the construction set approach allows us to, to build multiple machines and variations from a, a given set. Um, and that's that's where we are so uh, that's the leaderboard I'll go right into the so as far as the CD co home we're planning on a like getting that really active right now we're in a mad flurry of documenting uh, pretty much as in training materials for people who would like to build 
these houses who can actually study an immersion program either by themselves or with us, of course. Um, so the CD Eco Home, that's a big one. And we're planning at this point, planning two builds for the year. And I want to put out the schedule up by February 15 uh, for a lot of the events that are happening. But uh, one on site here, a second replica of the CD Eco Home, so we can pretty much perfect and, and verify the building techniques so we can build the, the, the whole thing, including the, all the off grid systems in five days. And then we're planning on going to Utah. There's a collaborator. Uh, who actually bought one of our brick presses. So he's got a brick press over there and we're going to do our first 1500 square foot, the, the one and a half foot story structure CEB. All the walls CEB on the first floor. So they have the brick press. They're going to plan on pressing over 6,000 bricks and we're going to build and we're probably going to do that in a six day week. Just give ourselves one extra day because before we worked with framed modules not bricks bricks are harder to work and they're way heavier and so forth they're much more um, solid and require more work first in pressing and then then pr uh, moving like it'll be about 50 or so pallets of bricks that we have to lay all around the house and then build from that um, with a really super efficient workflow everything lined up you know basically the ergonomics of build people uh, passing the bricks, one person laying the bricks, one one person slurring the mortar, uh, one person uh, mixing the mortar mix and so forth. So, so very well detailed based on all the experience. I mean, our experience is pretty much building up uh, so that if we decide to build this uh, seed eco home with brick, that I think that's a major accomplishment. Nobody builds a brick house in like those that five day period from start to roof. So, so that will be really exciting. And definitely a revenue generating opportunity for that i think many people would like to learn that and start doing that so we want to franchise open source franchise that out train a lot of people uh get that going as a way to scale the scale the open source ecology work i think that there's huge potential there uh so yeah we'll we'll continue with that right now i'm working on a biodigester so this is the cad and free cad i pulled off a, an ibc tote from grabcad and then uh actually had bad crashing issues like like I would copy the the tote and it would not save the second tote and I was like what is going on I the workaround I found was to do a clone not a copy like control C control V no that didn't work uh, the clone in the uh, in the draft workbench worked so that this could save properly but I probably lost like an hour or two uh, when it didn't save my second tote so so far I've got the, the, the you can see in a in the bottom there there's a macerating lift pump, just some of the initial fittings, but I pretty much spent all the time uh, getting pissed off at FreeCAD until <laughs> I found the work, or, to work around there. But yeah, now that I have, I've got the basic procedure, we can start filling in the fittings. It's a system that's, um, the biodigester is going to be all automatic, so basically you flush the toilet or the kitchen sink, which both have macerator lift pumps, and that would feed the digester so we can get cooking gas for the home. Now that's pretty sweet. We we aim to offer that as a regular feature of the CD Eco Home. So that's the purpose there. But this this relates to Ruslan's work on a pipe workbench. Ruslan, are you here? Do you? Yes, you are. You want to give us a little update on that? Uh, I I tried the the macros. Uh, only a couple of them work for me. I couldn't generate elbows or T's, but the macro looks good. But it just wasn't working well for me. Some issues about file directory structure or something. Ruslan, can you can you uh, pipe in? Any updates on that? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I still don't know what, what is the, the, hmm. uh, the reason which uh, caused uh, the bug. Uh, okay. Uh, today I downloaded the uh, OS E Linux. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, a live CD. Oh, can I boot from it? Yeah. Okay, then I will use it uh, and uh, test. Okay, yeah, you gotta do that. That's. I mean, that's. So you haven't tested on actually on OSE Linux. No. Okay, okay, you gotta do that. So let's do that. Um, there, this is exactly why Linux OSE Linux exists, so that we avoid these issues. Because it's working for you. You're able to generate your parts, but I'm not on my uh, OSE Linux or my home computer. It's probably something about directory structure. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I guess as a future guide for everybody, 
uh, to avoid any issues like when we're developing things like macros or new developments for FreeCAD and so forth they as soon as we know they work well first we want to test them within free within uh, OSC Linux and then once they are working then we can put them into the burn the official new release of the OSC Linux which we're aiming to do about uh, four times a year so every three months like right now we want to add these pipe libraries to OSC Linux I also want to do sweet home 3d I'm not sure how well that's working I, I think that is on OSC Linux uh, we got to verify that because we're going to be getting heavy into sweet home 3d uh, because a lot of this year will be like Katarina is working pretty much full-time documenting the the CD Co home we want to modify that for brick construction and so forth so we're going to be using CD Co home but yeah OSC Linux use it so see if um, I guess the the solution there, Ruslan, is see if you can make it absolutely work on Linux, uh, the OSC Linux version 1.0, which is the latest official release, and then then hopefully we can resolve these issues. And that will probably tell you what was wrong with the the desktop, um, the the other other versions of FreeCAD. Yeah, is that does that yes. sound like a plan? I think you found strange that you was able to generate a cross. Right, because right. It also uses all, all the technologies, yeah. uh, graphical user interface, and comma separated values files. Hmm. Uh, it's nearly the same as uh, the other yeah. uh, uh, other macros. And okay. you can use uh, it, works with cross, but doesn't work with other things. It's very strange. Yeah. But I, I, will, I will find out uh, what, what is the reason. Yeah, no, it's very useful. What I ended up doing was actually downloading the parts from. Um, McMaster car like you can find some of those uh, typically you find a lot of them some of them they don't have but uh, so far I've been able to find a lot of parts there but um, that's that's pretty messy it's of course much more convenient if you just say okay drop down two inch T and right there you have it within FreeCAD of course that's gonna be much faster to do so um, definitely a big case for the, the workbench mm -hmm. all right okay, well we'll yeah okay let's move on here so so next topic on the agenda here is the extreme build. So I mentioned in a day, I, j I mentioned that we we're planning two of them for this year. And I want to make that like, I mean, hopefully by next year, we're doing one every four months of uh, this year. It's going to be for the house build uh, and just the house, no aquaponic greenhouse. Like we can consider the aquaponic greenhouse for another workshop, but uh, a house end of October and then beginning of November. So pretty much back to back. For next year, the schedule would be like probably like one one every three months or so, and if it's like in January, February, March, that would have to be somewhere in the southern United States or somewhere where it's warm. But yeah, looking at two house builds this year and doubling that every year um, <laughs> until we're building a lot of houses. Um, you want to look at also uh, click on the Church in a Day link. The, it's actually even way faster and more ambitious than we are, though they're not so regenerative. They build a regular structure with 300 people. In 30 hours so you can click click on that on page one of the, the document but that's um, so what we're doing is actually nothing new it's like barn raising of the Amish or the church in a day people they do that uh, full church like 3,000 square feet like 300 square meters in a single day we do ours in five days but then we've got the biodigester the photovoltaics um, some of the other renewable features in the system which makes it probably much more complicated but yeah um, there's good work on that by other groups so there are pr good precedents in case anybody doubts the power of this method and you can and of course one of the highlights of that is that energy that very good energy that is just really exciting when people are on a mission all working together to build a large structure in a rapid time like that so it's a fun time so we believe in this social production model as opposed to the normal um, a consumer capitalism part um, doing the social production the peer production route has these very unique elements that are quite valuable for a lot of people okay next item so let's talk about the extruder uh, Roberto you wanna fill us in on the latest yeah just modify the extruder body to add the 8 millimeters and Nice. CMD sensor. And uh -huh. well, um, I emailed to Rusa yep. the people, and, and they told me that they can share a list of spare parts f 
for for their machine. But I have to I, I have to have an order number. <laughs> oh wow. So interesting, uh, yeah. Well, in, any, anyway, the, um, I, I was seeing the, the different parts of the extruder and the, well, there are two specific parts that could be difficult to, to get. Uh -huh. One is the Bontech pulley. Hmm. And, well, I, I, fa I found a, a purchase link mm -hmm. for that. And the also is the filament sensor mm -hmm. and, and that's I think this is the hard part because this is um, is um, manufactured by Brusa also oh wow so and, and, and I, I also find some sketches or um, information about that sensor and mm -hmm. It's available in GitHub, but it will requ require some more advanced knowledge about um, building those kind of things. Uh huh. And that's uh, so. There's a little circuit there. What is it like? A little laser diode or something? Like a little LED or something? Mm. Or? I'm not very sure. I I, I mm -hmm. was uh, reading that it could be. Um, a sensor like in the ma in the mouse's the yeah la laser sensor in, in a mouse yeah okay and that's not so <laughs> it's kind of interesting that they're kind of hiding their stuff now a little bit that's uh not exactly open source so basically what's happening there is that there but did they say that they will release the plans later on sometime in the future like the no full? no it's it's just uh, they they release that only for people who had um uh, purchased their, their machines huh well that's that's kind of so. unfortunate but if that's the case i mean they're really that's going towards uh, uh I don't want to say MakerBot, but that's a that is a MakerBot movement of just enclosing, not sharing the information fully on what that really is. That's not really open source, as far as I'm concerned. Um, did they? Uh, did anyone criticize that, or, or is that? I mean, is nobody screaming about that? Have you heard people complaining that that's not really the open ethic? Uh, could be. I, I am not uh, aware about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, because uh, I mean, Prusa has been born and proud as you know, based on an open source method, hardcore on it, to the point that the founder <laughs> Joe Joseph has tattooed the open source hardware logo on his arm. <laughs> so it's for me, it's rather surprising that it's uh, it sounds like there's some. Uh, just a little less transparency than I would expect here. Um, yeah, so let's see what we can do about that. Uh, do you have the the skill set to look at more? Like, w would you understand? Like, if if you research a little bit on the sensor, can you follow up on that, or d should we get some more people to help on that? Or uh, we can we can uh, can ask some other people, like our collaborator from. Um, with a thunderhead filament maker they they have a filament sensor i think and they're well at least they have a filament width sensor and i'm not sure how that relates to this um maybe their filament width sensor actually has a run out sensor as well but that that also means that marlin has to support that and i know it supports the width sensing and yeah we just, just got to look at a little bit more into it um yeah. Hey guys, I posted. I posted in chat. Um, I have a Prusa printer on order, so we do have ah. an order number. That oh, okay. Can... All right. Well, that's that's one way to get that, and um, and that way they. So Roberto, what they said is that they give what they sell the parts, or they actually provide a link to the parts where you can buy it somewhere else. 
Um, Can we actually no, buy the sure part? I, I think they they sell the, the parts, or, or probably they try to sell the parts by themselves. Uh huh. Yeah. So would you mind maybe f find out about uh, the details of the parts, like get the full bill of material, see if that exists, and and figure out which things are missing. Like if you can do a spreadsheet on that. Let's see. Did um, did we set up a a development spreadsheet page for the film, the extruder? I don't think we have one, right? Do we have one? Do no, we have a page? No. I don't think so. Okay, let's set one up, and if you can put on the the short development template. So if you go to development template yeah it's not, it's not the uh, if you go to development template it redirects you go to the template page so click on just it's just template and pick the the 20 column the simple template if you can do that so we can track all the stuff the BOM the CAD and all that in one place and I'd like to emphasize that since since we're, we want to scale up and get a lot of different projects going on I do still believe from our record the simple the templates the the simple spreadsheet of of items is a pretty effective way to go about it so we can pretty much any any new project we do and any new module so this this template can be applied to the sub module like the extruder which is a sub module of the printer we want to get granular like that in order to allow more people to contribute to different parts so please set that up and see where we can go on, um, yeah, what details we can gather up, like how complete is the BOM and so forth. Um, so basically like the exploded part diagram would be a good thing, like item number three, conceptual design, if you can do a, like label the parts and see what's missing and so forth, so it's really transparent. So if somebody takes this project on with you, they can just click on all the aspects of the simple template and find all the all the development assets right and Lex when is uh, your printer arriving maybe maybe you can uh, maybe you guys can can talk to each other Roberto and you can you guys collaborate and and maybe um, one either get those parts or identify where we can get them so like we can have a full BOM and we can actually build this because the, the other way to go is to go to the former version of the Prusa extruder which I believe had all the parts and everything was documented around it. So that's an, another way to go. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, my order, it's still on back order. I have no idea. It, I mean, it should be next month is, is according mm -hmm. to their schedule. But my order is still, it just says back order. There's no estimate or anything on it directly. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let's find out more explicitly Roberto can you clarify just a little bit so so they said that they sell those parts only to people who already have the printer or it's is that what they said oh no no um, I, I just um, I, I, got, I got that that answers from different um, uh, forums not, not from the mail they in the mail they say they said um, you must have access to the spare parts in our eShop to see this and I can grant you access would you need would you would just need an order number okay um, yeah Lex can you can you provide that then and and um, can you guys collaborate on that and just let's get access to that yeah absolutely yeah yeah I guess so they're just selling that part, but if we know what the part is, there's probably other sources where we can make it or whatever. Um, we'll see. Um, the, the parts you're pointing to, can you tell us a little bit? So the, the part with the blue arrow, um, t tell us more, the, the, all those parts, what they are. Yeah, the, <coughs> the, um, that, that part with the blue arrow is the Bontek Pule. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the other uh, and and the, that pulley includes um, that that part with the blue arrow. Th those little um, 
cylinders with the green arrow and also okay. the um, the shaft that is below. Okay. Uh huh. And the filament sensor um, is not shown here. Filament sensor? No, no. I I can put a, another picture. Okay. Um. All right, so yeah, let's let's look at it. Now, w what are the next steps here? Like if we get those parts, okay, I see. So that's the little uh, sensor. Um, now the next thing would be to, sh to look at um, how that integra integrates with, with Marlin. Is that all supported? Um, Lex, uh, are you, uh, would you be able to maybe look at that or? Does Marlin support the the Prusa filament sensor? Let's see what um, we need. Yeah, I can. Uh, what is what is uh, Prusa used now for their software? They they have their own software, as far as I know. Um, oh, really? Does anyone know what they're? Does anyone else know what they're using? I think it's their own complete. Like I think they wrote it from scratch. It sounds like. Or I mean, I they modified. Uh, la latest I read was they modified Marlin so much that's really not Marlin anymore. Uh, they're also using a different, different board, different controller board. Yeah, yeah. Look into that. See what see what state of art exists for Marlin filament sensing. So we can retrofit this or. Or if not, we just avoid it altogether. One way to do it is completely without it, and we just got the plain extruder, no filament sensor. Um, now, Roberto, in your CAD, is the filament sensor shown? Uh, no. How do they mount no, they, is no, it? Is it like, do you have any more idea how that's mounted? It's like mounts right on top or something like that? or? Uh, yeah, yeah, right in the in the top. Um, mm -hmm. There's um, a little cover, mm -hmm. and the um, and the sensor is inside that. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah, so it looks like a relatively simple kind of a sensor. Is that a is that sensor board require only that, or is there like a second detector part? Um, Do you know? No, I, I think it's the it's the only one. Um, but maybe there's another. Uh, well, I I have to to check that to check the the assembly instruction because I I I I don't remember another specific part for sensing or something like that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can take a look at it. But yeah, let's track that down. See what we can do. I don't see any... I'm looking at the CAD and I'm not seeing... In your CAD, the, no. it's not shown. Does it go like inside this hole? Or like... Is it like right above um, this... Right below the lid? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right there. Right below the lid? Okay. You can hit it. You can hit that top part, and you should see the space for the sensor. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah. That slit is. Oh, yeah. That's the space for the sensor, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. That's good. Yeah, so that little board goes into this slot right here and looks at the filament going in through this hole. Yep. Are these these two holes that's for mounting the top? Just that's these other two holes. Looks like they mount the uh, top sorry. piece. These two other bolt holes, not for not the filament hole, but the other two holes, they just mount that little top cover. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
we can depending on the state of marlin like basically like you know how much skill do we have on marlin i know marlin the trouble about marlin is that not it's not uh, when i was working with it, it was just painful because it's not documented fully anywhere uh, there's parts of it that are documented but it's it's uh, kind of a mess not well maintained um, so yeah if we can figure out how to use the the sensor filament sensor that would be good uh, we can also run without it and then we're like right now which where we don't have the filament sensor so that's not catastrophic but it definitely would be worthwhile to to have it um, any issues on the on a larger probe it, you were able to fit it without a problem uh, well I I tried different different options and finally use free cut <laughs> I was trying with Blender, but mm -hmm. it was uh, slow, slowly, mm -hmm. slow, slower. I don't know, but yeah, with with FreeCAD, I just um, convert the the STL shape to to a solid, mm -hmm. and and then I I could just remove or cut the the old. Uh, support for the probe yeah and then I I add a, a different uh, a, a larger support and just I made compound and then I, I can export as a steel again um, the sense the actual sensor you got from where you just drew that up right yeah, yeah, I, I drew. I just drew that up from the dimensions, and then the from and, the, the dimensions are. I, I think uh, they are okay. Yeah, we, yeah, looks good. And then the actual holder for the sensor, you you uh, you basically deleted the, basically erased the SDL part after you made it solid, and you just redrew it and. In the free CAD, this yeah. part, that whole part, you basically. How do you do that? It's a. I'm seeing a hybrid of STL and and free CAD. Is that a? Can you talk about that just a sec? Because it looks like here you're using the STL that's provided, but on the bottom part, your the ring is a free CAD drawn object. Is that right? Uh, no, that that part is is completely. Um, I mean, it's not a, an STL. You can export as an STL for printing, but right now is is a is a solid. Which you generated from from the STL by making it a solid. Yeah. yeah oh, okay. I, oh, good. In part workbench. Oh, good. And then you're able to modify it as a solid. Yeah, it, it's not um, so reliable, but uh, I, I tried to to make it work. Yeah, yeah, it's always uh, a little tricky working with because because of the issues of how the the STL gets converted might have some defects, and th then it was hard to work with it. Was that the issue? Y yeah, and, and also when. When I cut the the old uh, support for the sensor, mm -hmm. um, it's like um, an empty. It's created an, an empty space. Right. In the, in the yeah. Shape. Yeah. 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 I've seen that. So that that's so I I had to 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 fill that space with right. some cubes or. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any insights on how to address the issue? Like, if we have SDLs, it's kind of hard to work with them. I mean, I think the current policy is, I mean, make it a solid, but it's going to have defects. So sometimes we might have to choose between just, you know, taking a look at the STL and just redrawing it completely from scratch. Yeah, I don't know. No easy way. No easy answer. Right there. Hey, guys. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm on the parts list 
uh, website for Prusa. Yeah. Um, and it does show a bunch of parts. Is that what you're looking for? Like, which part specifically were you looking for? Components of the extruder. Yeah, you wanna you wanna oh, share your screen? Um, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yes. So if I go into parts, this is the what I see. Is that the same stuff you guys can see, or there's uh, a nozzle? Yeah, yeah. An yeah I saw that. No, this is not the the place. I think you you have to go to. Um, something called each e eShop and well the in the email they told me that you you're supposed to be required for a an order number. Okay, so, so I have I mean I have an order number. Right. Address vouchers. Hmm. Alright, I guess I thought that's what you what you were looking for is the uh, 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 also I, Lex. Yeah. Yeah. yeah also, I, I remember um, people uh, asking about these things. They told that they they had to to chat with with people from Prusa support so they can um, make things available for you for the parts that you want to to buy or to replace okay I'll, I'll, I'll email them I guess yeah okay yeah let's let's solve that but otherwise other than that I mean uh, yeah we, we do want to track down the parts so we know exactly what they are and then make a decision we, we can just buy those parts or or um, Possibly make them if possible, but but I mean they got to be able to be made, uh, made or bought somehow. So let's see what we, if we can track that down, and we can build it. Um, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. That's good. It's uh, it is kind of scary though the price on the that little drive gear being fifty dollars. Uh, I mean that is kind of pricey though just for the little little drive gear thingies um yeah i mean that's that's i don't i don't like the price on that cuz it's just a simple little little piece that's worth a uh, dollar in materials uh, yeah Okay, well let's let's see what we, what we can do once we have the final final list. Maybe they offer well, we can possibly find this somewhere else or a little cheaper or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, continue to uh, some of the next next work. 3D printer extruder, good stuff. Um, yeah, power cube. Um, let's hear about that, Abe. That looks good. You got, um, yeah, mm hmm. Um, starting to get some holes and details into the uh, cube and stuff. I'm looking for uh, different fittings and things. I think I figured out some of the information on the fitting sizes, although. Uh, I think I need to go back and review some information we talked about. I think the some of the interconnects on this system because I <clears throat> want to make sure that the uh, you know there's enough the fittings are large enough for the volume of fluid and so on and this I, I don't know there's more hose than this I guess in the system since there's a lot of interconnects but but I assume that like the the one inch barbs welded into the um, uh, Tank and and for, let's see for uh, um, action lines and then the uh, return. It looked like on the previous one it was three quarter. Uh, I assume something like that would be good. I don't I don't know if we need to. <coughs> Same as the last one. The last one was all good. Oh yeah. Well, actually, I, I take that back. We if we got ten gallons per minute, we don't need the three quarter lines. Uh, depends depends where we are. If we're yeah. 
if the if we're talking about the main power cube which has got more than one one fluid flow through it then one half will not do if it's just a single line that we know it's only 10 10 gallons per minute one half is fine so it just depends which 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 hose like the return on the main main power cube if it has individual returns they're all they're all just um I, no, I think we had two return ones, which which that makes them 20, which means we need three quarter. I think that was the latest we talked about. Um, uh, the only other thing, if you look at my screen, actually, which I'm sharing, is this is the photo of the coupler. So, um, in the last, this is the micro track, and the, the one that was built in November of last year, and the the coupler is homemade it's just a plate with a welded tube and another small plate just for the bolt pattern of the hydraulic pump but that coupler from the face of the plate is exactly three inches so that is a two inch heavy wall pipe that's all that is and it's three inches long uh, let me just paste cut and paste that picture into the work doc does that make sense, Abe? Okay, yeah, I see how that. Uh, yeah, I think. I can get that figured out and double check that against the uh, uh, pad. Uh, it looks, yeah, it looks like a pretty heavy part. So that's yeah. Uh, so you, one side of it is is square. I see. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just to match the bolt pattern of the engine. So. It. Um, and that bolt pattern of the engine, yeah, that's that's one of those things you kind of got to measure on the on a spot because it's, I don't think it's in the documentation of the engine itself. Um, and what's the best way to do that? It's probably the, at this point um, that definitely is worthwhile to have that. Basically, the the bolt pattern. Those are the, some of the critical parameters of any, any kind of engine. In fact, like if we use different engines, we should have library files of bolt patterns. Like if we know this engine has got this, um, we have that as a 2D CAD file. So we know the pattern. Because this the, that pattern, that flat piece, is going to be cut out with CNC. And uh, it's the only thing we can do right now is that we got to take. I got to take some of those measurements uh, exactly to, to get you that that bolt pattern. I don't think we recorded that. I think what we did in real life. I think we just matched it and kind of um, maybe put some marker on the holes and we just kind of like stamped a pattern with a sheet of paper. I think we used a sheet of paper, which then you can see the indents for the bolt holes, and then we just transferred that to the to the metal plate. Um, yeah, okay, I, I'm looking at that, and it, you know, it seems like the CAD, I was assuming the CAD looked pretty accurate relative to the pictures of the engine I've seen, but that looks like it might be, uh, the bolt hole pattern on the engine pad looks a little bigger than what I thought it looked like in, in the CAD that we've been using, so I wonder if that's not accurate now, I gotta... Yeah, well, the thing is, uh, it was really, I mean, those those bolt patterns are typically problematic because even when we got the off-the-shelf couplers, the bolt pattern didn't work, you know. So, oh, so I mean, it's always they're tricky. They're listed in the specs as some SAE bolt pattern, you know, to her. For the pump, pattern, we're, but, yeah, uh, for the pump, we're pretty good because that, that bolt pattern on a pump, you can that's well documented. So that piece by the pump you can look that up uh, for the pump that we have and that'll be good the, the question is on the engine and on the engine it actually has two sets of bolt patterns like one one is a little closer in the other one is a little close farther out and we used in this case I believe the farther out one to get more grip on it but I think what I need to do is get you those dimensions exactly and we assume like all the engines that we got so far have that um, the 16 horsepower engines have that exact pattern so I think we'll be good when we just document that and go with that for CNC cutting in the future um, 
Yeah. So let's yeah. See. On the CNC coating, I was thinking about the uh, hole sizes for the uh, uh, for welding in the uh, pipes, of the uh, the pipe nipples and so on for the drain and return. Uh, I think you know I suddenly had trouble before welding some of that with holes. So I'm guessing the way to do it is maybe to weld them on the inside through those holes. So. I guess the idea is, uh, I looked up this, and I'm kind of wondering what uh, you think the, the tolerances should be of the pipe for welding that up easy. I'm guessing you want to weld it on the inside before you assemble the tank, maybe, and then, you know, you can touch it up on the outside after if there's a, a leak or something, right? For the fittings into the tank? Correct. Yeah. Um, it's actually good to, the way we did it before... Uh, we did it when it was all still in flats. We did it before welding that up because it's just easy to get. It's right on a, you know, it's right on a flat surface instead of you having to reach on a thing that's three-dimensional at that point. So we did that. We put all those fittings in beforehand. Yeah, but that that gets down to the procedure. That's that's details that we can um, document. Um, yeah. Well. I'm just guessing that maybe you want like a tenth of an inch between the, the pipe thread, you know, and let's say the, the, for the hole size, because the, the CAD eventually will be used to make DXFs and then see and see that. So I'm, I'm just kind of guessing what, um, you know, kind of size and space. Yeah, and you do. You want, yeah, you want uh, like, yeah, like a 16, like a, a hole that's an eighth inch larger than the fitting, it's the threads of the fitting itself. So, um, yeah. Um, now, let's see, you're referring back to PC 17.11, and that's good, but I, we want to differentiate for the 18, version 18 now, because the 11, we did not build it with so many outlets like we're going to do now. Um, can you clarify that you've got uh, the multiple suction outlets on the... Um, on your picture there, but you're pointing to 1711. 1711 is the newest power kit. We started it uh, oh. back in November, oh, right? I see, I see. So I, don't, I haven't been, you know, November. Okay, changed okay. anything, but a new version uh, is ah, different. Okay, I mean, okay. th this is the version system for the for the live track upcoming. Ah, right? okay, yeah. Cause, um, Oh man, I'm losing track of this. We had a PC 17.08, right? And and 17.10. Okay. Okay. So that so I'm gonna look up PowerCube genealogy and make sure that's in there because I'm I'm even losing track of this here. Okay. So I have linked them up more recently on the PowerCube library page. Yeah. Uh, I think I've, I've, I've tried to get most of that linked up there. There's okay. Probably some more stuff to be added. Okay. Um, yeah, the library is the ultimate kind of like go-to with the official files, but the genealogy page, we want to keep track of that, and I'm noticing that PowerCube genealogy goes only up to PowerCube version 17.08. So let's go to 17.10, and then one for PowerCube version 17.11. Uh, and then you've got the, what are you calling these ones now? 18, the small ones? Seventeen eleven is the most recent. Well, I, I um, yeah, I guess I versioned it. We started all this back at seventeen eleven, so I made right. Let's see, I called it seventeen eleven, and I called it the, the main power cube in the auxiliary. Um, right. Let's get really um. Right. Right. So one. let's. But, yes. Okay. Yes, since those are two individual oh. instances, we need a separate page for each of those. So. Um, okay. Wait, I thought you had one that was you didn't have one that was PowerCube like version eighteen point oh one for the the small no. one. Uh, that's still seventeen eleven there. Okay. No. Yeah. I made both of those I think at the same time. We kind of started I see, them I together see. and they're based off of the same files. So yeah. Yeah, I guess it could be an eighteen oh one. Um, I'll have to look back at yeah how I started that. Yeah, yeah. Let's maybe do. Since I don't think we did any work in December, 
yeah definitely separated like like this is a great case of what I was just talking about to make things granular and because 17 the the small the auxiliary is not the same thing as the mother cube those need to be separate spreadsheets so we're not getting into the eventual problem of mixing parts up and you don't really know which goes with which I mean that's been a perennial issue so we got to just separate that into two yeah okay so yeah the auxiliary um one I probably started separately so that's probably 1801 yeah let's call that 1801 um, since that's that's the current work um, and so is 1711, which we started back in November, which is, uh, which is good. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, and it does, I mean, uh, it sounds like, you know, it's a pain in the ass to do that, but we have to do that because otherwise we'll just keep mixing everything up. Yep. All right, so the coupler is there. Uh, so you've got an idea of that. It's only three inches long. I'm not sure how long you have it in your drawing. Um, between the two metal plates it's thick. yeah it's not three inches thick no. it's it's uh it's three inches long and yeah, the okay, thickness so the is about 2.5 the original cad file I found that someone else had started was six inches long yeah for the uh, or overall uh, the, and then there's the, the shaft coupler between the two shafts I think is probably so that probably all has to be shortened. Yeah, yeah, we got to shorten that. So over there, I'll just emphasize that. Make sure we update that. Uh, put an arrow to that. Yeah, I think there's a number of details uh, that probably need to be adjusted like that in the CAD. So I mean, I guess the problem is getting calibers or you know measurements on all of the, the details on these things to get them updated right um, yeah yeah also I was gonna adjust let's see I did that grade on the cab but then I was thinking yep. I'm not sure the best for that cooler it can be bolted somewhere wherever it gets the best airflow on the front although there's some plumbing there that uh, yeah I think um, I would make the grate only up to where the where the cooler yeah, is because it just open up that space so we can actually reach yeah, in I think there. I'll have half the grate because you got to be able to reach in on that throttle, right? Yeah, yeah. There's the yeah. There's a throttle there, and there's a choke. So, um, yep, okay. that'll be good to open that up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as far as the the entry points to the mother mother cube, you're drawing in like two, four, five, five of them. Five. Yep. Entry point. Yeah, the no. suction, five suction lines altogether. Yeah, that's how many we need. Yeah. We're gonna go 80 and horsepower. Get, there's one return for the filter, but I think you said only. That's all you need. So all the other returns could be uh, separate, I guess. Uh, the Not return, just... because the return line filters are pretty large themselves, we can do like two two in to through a filter. Like the typical filter we get is 25 gallons per minute. Um, now if we have 50 all together, that's there'll be two filters. But then you'd have to do like two in one and three in the other, which is uh, we might have to draw in three re three return line filters, or just get like little smaller ones. Yeah, we have to make a decision on that. But okay. before I thought you said that you didn't think it was necessary to have. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're right. You're right. Sorry about that. That's exactly right. As long as yeah, one one is going to be sufficient because of the the high high turnover of fluid. Yep. No, no, that's that's good. You're exactly right. I forgot about that point. So that, yeah, that makes it definitely, <laughs> yeah, to fit like three filters in there, that's just a lot of mess. Yep. Put more return holes. Uh, yeah, one one for a filter, and then. Um, yeah, yeah, one for filter, and the other one are other ones are just return holes, return quick couplers, 
which we can weld like in. The, mm -hmm. the size on the fitting for the return on the other was three quarter. Um, but I think you were just saying that half. Was yeah, half enough. would be. If we're going with the 10, 10 gallon per minute out of each one of these power cubes, um, those quick couplers are rated for 12 gallons per minute. So yeah, we're definitely good with those. So we can do the half inch and that's, and the half inch are much smaller than the three quarter inch. So that's good. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good. Should it be three quarter on the filter? Yeah, the filter should, should filter be... Uh, should be that same one as we have on the existing power cube, and I believe that was a 25 gallon per minute filter, so you can look at those okay. specs. Yeah. yeah. 20. Yeah, so 25 GPM. Filter. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, I think we're getting the details done on this. Um, there's still cat to be adjusted a little here and there. And, well, I was editing a bunch of the, some of these files are a bit easier to edit, although sometimes I get some bugs with the free cat too that's taking up time. But, um, yeah, the other thing I was just trying to figure out how to optimize cutting some of the, the parts and so on because going to CNC cut everything real nice. Yeah. Uh, be good to cut out as many, you know, like smaller parts from larger waste parts and so on. And yeah. Some of the dimensions that don't matter can be adjusted to, to get more parts out and so on. That's that's just a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah. That, that'll take a lot of um, detail work. Yeah. Yeah. We can, the cutouts can be used to make other parts and stuff like that um, yeah we can optimize for that I mean sometimes you could get away with um, like if you really want to be conservative on material use um, it is a very good idea to cut out the whole side so you've got six pieces that are the entire cube um, about well, a little more than six but it's in principle a cube's got six sides so you should be able to cut out those six sides from six pieces now because we have a tank on one side that's a seventh piece uh, makes it very convenient. Now you can cut those down into smaller parts in order to be able to do the nesting much more, much more tight. But that means you have to weld, do more welding of things back up, and then you can consider the trade-off of wasting that metal versus having to do additional welding. Now welding is principle in principle not not bad. You can you know if you cut something with a torch table, you can weld it right back up. That's the beauty of metal. Uh, as long as you can align it properly. So, if we, so if we have proper alignment procedures, we can we can cut more parts to get better ne better nesting. But um, uh, which of course is going to take a little more time, but it will save a lot of materials. So we'll have to weigh that um, the trade offs of that in the future. Of course, yeah. Of course, I I mean, the ideal sorry, ideal situation would be that uh, we take all the cutouts once we have the induction furnace they, they get melted back down and rolled into into new steel that that's the that's the uh, ultimate it will cost some energy but if that energy is a is solar then it it's not it's it's still very decent so the big upgrade i would like to do here at the farm at factory farm is uh I've been really thinking a lot about that 100 kilowatt array on a, like a 4,000 square foot workshop. So we're thinking about adding another workshop. We're, get, we're running out of space in this one. It's a, the one we have right now is like 3,000 square feet or so. But if we build the next one, due to the low cost of PV panels, I want to put on, I want to go back off grid. So. Uh, we started off grid and we ran generators, lister engines on vegetable oil, PV power, but then we just grew and then we just had to connect to the grid. But now I think PV went down so much that we can afford like a hundred kilowatt PV array. It'll still be like hundred kilowatts. You can possibly get it for like $25,000, but that's, that's actually achievable with our budgets. Yeah, I saw your cement factory oh, yeah. calculations for solar. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's a lot of power. And very yeah. Heavy, but, yeah. I mean, but I guess it wasn't so much cement as lime cycle. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea there is crazy. It's that if we get a lot of solar on the rooftop, that means you can have a lot of industrial process, including hydrogen generation, actual making of con of lime lime cement. You're just simply burning burning limestone and induction furnaces melting metal. I mean, you can practice talk about that pra being actually practical. So I was writing uh, about what it would take to do that. I'm covering that in a book just to show uh, all the possibilities with solar, which I, uh, there's a huge case for solar. I mean, the prices of PV are just dropping down so much that it it's a, it's a very interesting proposition. I mean, nobody in the world today has considered making, for example, concrete production that's solar powered. And the calculations say that it's feasible. It pays back for itself if you just bought the solar panels to, to run the electricity to burn the lime. It pays back for itself based on current concrete prices in a year. Like I was calculating like 360 days if you're just burning limestone and selling that at $10 for a 100 pound bag. In 365 days you paid back your PV panel cost which is, I mean, that's pretty ridiculously good so uh, you can take a you can dispute my numbers once you see them uh, they're in a book you can you can actually read all that it's on my it's on my log great. Um, the great sea pen look really cheap but I, I keep seeing stuff that there's likely to be tariffs I think coming oh yeah 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 panels so I don't know how that's affected well that means we gotta hurry up to the PV production facility which is right now slated for like 21 20 a few years from now we're gonna look at the big roadmap uh, just future tentative ideas of what we'd like to do, but in about five within five years, we want to do. Uh, we want to start cranking out um, PV panels. I was reading about Tesla Giga Factory. Uh, so Elon Musk invested into a big gigawatt scale manufacturing facility for PV panels for all his solar work. Um, now that's a case that's still that's great but that's still a case of centralization so so instead of one gigawatt factory talk about a thousand factories that produce a megawatt each you know that's that's a much better socially and distributed production wise case because with the big centralized uh, production facilities i mean you still run into a lot of problems uh just a standard problem of centralization yeah um anyway let's uh theory aside here let's move on here so last last thing here is um, so D3D Australia, okay, Herman, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Good afternoon, how are you? Good, good. Um, I was, um, I was working on it yesterday and, uh, I just, uh, wanted to, um, Talk about two two main things here. I, I changed the uh, the extruder to the other side, but I did that only last night, so I haven't um, I haven't tried or done anything with it yet. But I just wanted to double check if I have the everything right because uh, as as it goes, um, if, if I put the motor the X motor to the left, yeah, uh, yeah, I will have to pack those those cables there fairly tight and um, that was probably one of the reasons I put it on the other side to start with because I didn't want it to rotate the or to change the extruder nozzle at the end yeah. of, the, of the motor um, but if that if, if what you look at the picture is what what the standard is I will I will make sure that I will I sort something out to use it as it is it's, it's not a big deal I will just um, have to pack those cables tight, um, but before I do, I just wanted to make sure that the the sensor is in the right position and the nozzle is in the right position. The yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. The extruder is facing towards the z-axis. The x-axis is on the left-hand side. The x motor there. The y motors are in the back, right, and left. That's right, and then yeah. the but we have the controller on the left-hand side as well, so that um, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. I, will, I will have yeah. to move the controller and the power supply unit so the cables still reach. Otherwise, I will have to. Uh, uh, I don't have enough cable there for uh, for the movement of of X to the extreme uh, sort of Y one front position. Uh, wow! So your print, you got you modified the steps per, per millimeter. It was the yeah. the the. the the official version was a hundred steps per Z, right? Yes, uh, no, it says uh, eighty. Eighty, um, eighty. Yeah, or oh, at least in the in the Marlin in huh. the Marlin version is eighty, uh, and it was a hundred for the extruder. Um, but for some reason, I was having this uh, strange thing that I couldn't find huh. an answer. Um, on online that is only the first probably 10 layers or so were being uh, squashed and the rest of the print was good but um, the overall length the overall high of the print will be in the case of that cone that you see here uh, it was meant to be 30 millimeter tall and it ended up being something like 27 millimeter tall um, hmm. Uh, and the, the little cube in, instead of 10 millimeter will be 9 millimeters tall. Hmm. Um, so at the end, this is the last solution I found, and I changed the steps per millimeter. It took me a couple of attempts, but at 83, hmm. I got I got very close to 30 millimeter for the coin that I was trying, and closer to 10 millimeter for the cube. Huh, wow, that's that's interesting. I mean, we never had never ever messed with that once we uh established that at 80. Yeah, no, that's a that's a mystery to me. I mean, I don't know why there's that slight, I mean, slight difference. Uh it may I don't know, maybe something t I mean, it could be like the quality of the filament actually, possibly. Yeah, that could that could be one thing. Because, I mean, there's, otherwise there's no difference. I mean, I'm just wondering why that, you, the the stepper motors should have exact, exact same motion. I mean, that I think we yes. can be pretty sure about that. So what else is changing the height? I mean, it's probably... I am, I am worried, I'm a bit worried that my, I might have a, a glitch of some sort in my electronics. Um, hmm. Because sometimes that overall height of the print is not quite the actually dig in the in the bed mm -hmm. and uh, it was a one one of, of a kind sort of uh, error I don't know why I did it but, um, it, it broke the three points and when I realized it was digging it, it dug a hole in the three points uh, in the PEI uh, surface yeah um, that was before I changed the steps per, per millimeter but anyway um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit weird because the the, the 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 error was not consistent through the whole length, through the whole height of the piece being printed, only in hmm. the bottom in layers or so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, to me, that's that would I would say that's some mechanical artifact, where maybe something's getting pulled or something. I mean, are you? Is the motion on all the axes good? Yeah, it's all free. It's all, it's yeah. all uh, nice and free. No obstructions. No dangling. Hmm. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't figure out anything. Yeah. I don't know. That's a mystery to me. But but you think you figured it out by changing the steps? It seems well, like it's that, okay. Yeah, that, that is the last print number four there on the. Photo. And you, what are you showing there? You're showing a top view of a cone? Yeah, this is a top view. It's a two-part cone. It's a flat cone and a tall cone put together. It's sort of a witch hat, if you want uh -huh. to call it something. Uh, that is two cones to try. I just wanted to see it. The definition of the steps on the on the base when I made it, and um, so 
So one and two is the outward going cone, and and two and four are the is the opposite one. No, no, I just happened to run out of the orange filament. Um, but one and two, they are all the same cone, all exactly the same uh, shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and one and two is basically the same um, same settings. Um, now one, two, and three are basically the same settings. I changed some of the. Um, I might have changed some of the settings in Kura, but basically, it's just to show that it looks squashed. Um, I thought it was extruding in excess to start with. Um, in one, it skipped a couple of um, a couple of, of layers, as you can see. There is like there is like a step there. Yeah. Uh, but then two and three is like it's, it was squashing somehow the the layers, and I thought first that it was extruding. In excess, uh, excess material, but um, no, it was actually pressing down because when I started looking up close, I could see the bed really uh, flexing. Yeah. Um, Let me see. And number four, there is pretty much perfect. Um, there are little details in the in the definition, but um, it didn't miss a bit. And uh -huh, so the four the. The the rough looking part that's that's just the that's the pad, that's the bottom pad, and then the smooth part is where it starts printing up. Yes, yes, that's correct. The, the bottom part I should I should have put a, a side picture of the coin, but the bottom part rises around about four millimeters from from or three millimeters from the from the base. So from right to left on that image. There is a rise of three millimeters, roughly. So it's a it's a cone that is very flat. It's a four um, a fourteen millimeter uh, diameter cone that is very flat. Yeah. Rises towards the center. It's like a. I should have put another picture there to give you a better idea, but it's not flat. That part that part that you see with all the lines is not flat. It's actually rising. Uh huh. Why is it so much different at the the rough part and then the smooth part? Oh, because the the rough part the, it looks. Uh, you know when the, the the printer has to do a very um, a very mild slope. Yeah. So it's it's a slope that you will see the the steps as a printer because the definition doesn't allow you to make um, smaller variations. So each one of those steps that you see there is 0 0.2 millimeters. Okay. Uh, is that changing that in, in um, high of 0 0.2 millimeters? Okay. Um, and, and at the moment, I can I can uh, make a, a quick calculation if I count the rings, if I count the number of rings, and multiply them by 0 0.2 millimeters. I get roughly very close to the, uh, the to the height that I am I was looking for. If I measure that with a caliper, I'm getting something like two point two point eight. I think there are fourteen layers, and uh, I needed two point eight millimeters. Um, so you're saying that four printed well, but one, two, three did not. I mean, one yeah, looks one, good. Two, three are, are, are misprints. Are prints that are not. Um, the, the, the long part that rises from the middle, the cone that rises, uh, that printed okay. But the, the base, that definition on the slope wasn't printing okay because the first layers were being squashed. Yeah. Okay. Four is the no, product that has the 82. Yes, or 83. 83. I haven't yeah. checked with 82 yet. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't know why, I mean, the only thing I could, only variable there is the thickness of the the filament that I could think of. Huh, steps per millimeter. Does anyone ha else have any idea of why it, like, we have s s the setting for how fast the, the, the extruder is spinning, and and this is the first time we're having to modify it to get better results. 
Um, never seen it out of, say, 50 machines or so. It's one of those um, oddities that I know is concerning because it's not one of those things that uh, seem to did you, uh, be... A did you Google it? Did you find out if anyone else is having issues like that? Yeah, I Googled that and I found a lot of um, chat rooms or, or, or logs that have this, this issue, but nobody had... Everyone was talking about this elephant food and it's not that it's not the elephant food because this was doing it consistently on on a particular point and um it was not just the formation it was it, it, it looked like it was squashing the whole the whole session and uh, i only found one person saying something about the steps per millimeter uh, but there was yeah that's where the conversation ended nobody replied to saying that there was a, um, a resolution or not the problem. Yeah. Uh, but this is, to me, the only thing that at the moment has worked to solve that problem and has broke the pieces, it's this cone and the cube to the right overall length, which is uh, which was 30 millimeter for the cone and, and 10 millimeters for the cube. Yeah. So, so the bottom line for right now is that with 83, it, it pretty much worked. Yes. Hmm. Okay, well, I'll just document that and in our troubleshooting. But uh, if it's 83, though, it's, it does work, but we cannot explain why it works, right? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. the story. Hmm. Okay, well, well, that's a document that we have no clue about that. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thank you. Is that anything no. else? Okay. So, uh, typically throughout the meeting, if we have got questions and comments, there's a page number 11 at the end that we should uh, document those. Um, so, no circuit mill questions, comments on the last page. Yep. Um, all right. So to sum up, yeah, we're we're pretty good. Um, as far as the PVC pipe workbench, as soon as we have the next iteration of that, maybe uh, you can send it to me, but also send it to the to the whole group. Uh, I think you're on the email list. Uh, the last email is just respond to everybody and let people know that you've got the, the updated version that people can try because uh, it would be good for everybody to try that and, and uh, get familiar with the pipe pipe fittings workbench um, yeah for the CD home like we want to have the full cat like we have it all in sweet home right now and the utilities are not really in there but we want to draw up the full detail of all the utilities probably the best to do it in FreeCAD and there's a lot of pipes in there so that's that's where it will be quite relevant as we build a team so let's have everybody uh, go over that other than that any other comments or questions for today's session before we wrap up um, maybe some um, um, uh, work for me uh, I'm Roberto. Yes, yes. Um, well, if we, I mean, as soon as we work out the details on a printer, the extruder, we want to start printing that. And uh, I guess there's a slight bottleneck in terms of making sure we can get all those parts. So we can wait until we do that. Uh, until we verify that we can get all those parts and then we can move on printing and, and getting it. So, so the next thing I would suggest there is uh, actually to buy that. I can, I can, I can buy that for you. We can uh, send you the money to buy those parts. We can prototype it. Um, but in the meantime, um, what else do we have?
what is a priority thing that we can do? I mean, um, what is the overall state of the detail on the D3D CAD uh, for the the 13 inch? Is that pretty much complete, or is there any more? Um, well, I I can do some work with the with the the other parts like the spool filament spool holder the cable chain controller maybe yeah um, let's see looking at your cat and then there was the idea of the the extension like the widening of the frame. So there's the optimization of the print bed surface uh, as it stands, because because right now we were somewhere like like an inch or two under everywhere. That would be an important thing. I would say maybe focus on making all the up updates of just all the outstanding details there. Um, I think the main thing would be the optimization of the print bed area. What do you think about that? Because that means yeah. catting it out and then getting an appropriate bolt. So maybe we could put in a part order for for the longer bolts and make it make it better. Um, so so to optimize the cable wiring, like uh, make sure that uh, for one you would put in the cable chain in here as it should be, and then actually test printing larger things you said you printed things that are like like what six sixty millimeters is that um no no it was um six inches six inches so that's that's yeah. pretty good pretty good size um now we, what we want to do is we want to make sure that that is reliable for um just just long 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 time printing like for example a good test would be the actual like for the CEB press there's the the bushing holder holders for the rods uh, those are pretty if you print two of them uh, I was printing two of them at the same time but maybe we could do like a long test of, of like when everything in the cable chain is fully lined up you've got the spool holder that's pretty solid um, Yeah, I would I would just uh, continue with all the upgrades to make this like a fully production machine that's fully documented, and then then it could be okay. This is our official 13-inch version, because right now we're missing a few of those details. So the priority is bed size, uh, making sure we can reach all the corners of the bed, and that means possibly updating uh, like exactly left to right where the z-axis is, if if we need to reach a little bit more area. Um, so little little shifts like that, maybe we can uh, do that. Uh, the thing that we, um, not sure how much we talked about it, but I know that the the end stops take quite a bit of room. They're like an extra inch, probably more than than what we would really really need. Uh, simplifying that so it's it's just a little little end stop without the big structure on it. That's another thing we can consider uh, to get like a probably like almost an inch of, of travel space potentially. Um, have you examined like with um, with the current extruder, the, the updated one, are you getting more air? Have you looked into that yet or is it just about the same? Um, no, it should be more in the Y axis. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I would say work on that, like really just nail all the maximum possibility to get a full 8x8 eight eight area for like an official release of this this version of the printer. So yeah, there's there's a bunch of details like just shifting things a little bit here and there, uh, kind of the optimization work. Um, okay. So so start by documenting exactly like, like the, you know, uh, do the CAD, move things around, and, and document clearly in a in a diagram. Okay, I'm getting 
x by y and z what exactly are those numbers um, you should of course compare like when you're when you got your CAD is that um, what you're actually getting for the real life but you don't have the extruder yet which we want to move on as soon as we get so as soon as we uh, clarify all the parts on the extruder I mean let's just try to nail that um, see if those parts are available and plan on buying those parts and building the next extruder um, so we can make a decision on that and to go forward and then you can test the the new extruder version with this with the expanded axes so that we we max out the 8x8 area and we can get that full size instead of like you know 7x7 seven seven or 6x6 six six. Um, okay I, I can also start a, a bill of materials for the the Prusa extruder definitely so, so mm -hmm. yeah. now so for the, for the Prusa extruder set up the development template page so set up the spreadsheet there's BOM but I mean literally when you think about the website like say we finally end up putting up a website for organizing workshops right you want to have the absolute full CAD renderings like maybe you know all the assets there the full full instru full like uh, part drawings all the assets there in the uh, essentially in the in the development template uh, we want to do that like as we get this to a final product that that's where it has to go so there is I mean there's many hours of work there to be done um, yeah I don't know how much you've been thinking uh, about have... yeah go ahead yeah I have a question yeah um, for the print for the printed parts of the extruder um, yeah sh should I update the uh, upload of those parts to the wiki or just use the, the link in the Prusa website um, you can't just use the Prusa website because you modified them already so we gotta we gotta let's just copy them down to our site in case that they pull them from their website <laughs> no but we should we should have that since they're also modified so we, we want to have a one-stop shop and a part library for this once once we get the full part library that should be all on our page so it's easy all in one place um, I would I would just copy it over mm hmm okay yep yeah. and I don't know if you've been thinking about um, the possibility of a workshop but if you're excited about that about actually running a workshop where we organize one in Chile I mean I'd be up for that I mean I could potentially travel out to there but something where we we can get people to show up and and make printers um, I'm open to that if you wanna if you wanna try that as a as an actual workshop where you can generate some revenue from that as well so yeah I, I I'm not sure about it um, but maybe it, it, can be a good idea yeah yeah I mean I still wanna I'm, I'm still intending like I mean we've got to finalize the the print head um, and the larger size printers I think the value we can really provide to the overall ecosystem is when these frames are scaled to a little larger size like uh, for example you can you can completely weld a couple of these together so instead of like say the 16 by 16 printer we have a 16 by 32 printer right it's where you can print just basically scaling these just welding them together because the frame is completely modular you can you can double it up you know say you want to make it vertically much taller you you uh, weld up two of these uh, on top of each other so so there's a lot of possibilities where at the larger size we can get a very clear advantage for for making larger parts which would at that point you know the the printing filament is expensive so we we want to definitely have our our filament maker in, in shape by that time um but yeah i i'm intent on like for, for osc here just running running that on a very regular basis and right now kind of still pulling out of the winter but the 3d printer the house the brick press work like all those things those are high priorities for um, 
for regular ongoing workshops where we're producing that in a social production model so uh, yeah and the websites like all the assets like just the, the absolutely finished CAD and all that I mean that that has to happen so yeah if you can continue on the CAD and just extending this version to completion that yeah that would be that would be valuable yeah great just a uh, last question yeah um, do you have some news from the Thunderhead no I do not if we look at um, the wiki Thunderhead I haven't talked to him but he he basically was delayed by a week or two when when he had to do some other stuff on the uh, related to the filament maker so he wasn't doing documentation but let's see what when we go to the github page is there any updated information on that um, github so clicking on thunderhead tech for trade how does that look scrolling down it I see the nice he's he does have this nice overall diagram but it's not detailed we we need a very very f much fully more fully detailed version than that um, no I'm not seeing further documentation than the what we saw from the diagram before so I should check in with them um, it does look like there's some CAD work that has been done because this this appears to be a little more detailed than last time but I'm not sure okay um, that's a thing like it, if if Matt feels ready for that we can run off a workshop this year sometime building this thing we'd have to make that decision by February 15 or so because I really want to get the whole schedule down for this year so we'll within two weeks we'll know whether this is a go or no go f in terms of an actual workshop and we can still uh, do some work on this and um, but as far as a workshop we got to put that kind of stuff on a calendar so we have a, a, enough lead time to organize that all okay the well, last thing here I uh, just one one last thing on my side is meeting maintainer uh, is anyone interested in taking on that role basically maintaining the development team log page so that means starting a new document like this after every meeting inserting the effort graph uh, post the video the resulting video on the OSC workshops Facebook page and then like on the dev team log page organize the old meetings to hide them basically uh, update that page so we don't have like a hundred meetings on one page they're linked to you know to the history of meetings and then assign roles and introduce the meeting like some somebody would maybe like start this meeting and say hey call in this meeting to order and assign the role so that we can then get rolling anyone want to want to kind of take on the meeting maintainer role yeah i can do that who's that i mean i was kind of doing that for a while uh, lex. okay lex lex yeah i was kind of doing that last month too and, yeah you were uh, so yeah i can start that up again it's fine. okay that would be good so we have the ready document and is it convenient to do the current meeting page so that we don't have to scroll through all the past meetings on the, that other page uh, it's up to you guys I can do it either way I was actually thinking I might automate some of it but we'll see. yeah I mean automating would be cool um, but current meeting is the just so we don't have to load up all the meetings because it's all a bunch of these Google Docs that if there's more than like one like the current meeting that just loads up right up for me otherwise you have to kind of wait as you kind of scroll through this you have to wait for all the other stuff to to load up um yeah, yeah I, I like the idea of that log, on the dev team log page i was thinking if you could just delete the iframe links maybe and just leave the edit links or you know something like that you could just have the the most recent one with the uh publish to web uh visual that might make it a lot faster right that, yeah we could we could do that but that page already has a bunch of stuff in there um, I was thinking that the the best idea would be to leave like the last month like the last four right now we've got like 20 or 30 of them and then they're hidden at the end like pa under past meetings we're just linking to 
um, under past meetings just links to the separate wiki pages. I, I do think it's nice to kind of keep the thumbnail because you kind of can readily see what went on kind of in some way that meeting and it looks like actually something is going on <laughs> as opposed to just walls of links and text. Um, so I do kind of like that. Maybe we could keep like decide on just keep the last month and everything else just hide it but right now it's like all this all no. this kind of there's like there's like there's like 20 or 30 Revisions there all that anyway right so it doesn't i mean if, if you delete the old uh text from the previous month all but the last month it's that data is still in the previous wiki history right it is we, but i uh, really need to make other sub you're saying to just trash that because it's in it, like trash all those links because it's in the wiki history? Yeah, I mean, I know like with our logs, we've been copying it to old logs, which is, is nice because it's, it is more social, but technically it is in the history as well. I guess people uh, have technically to know how to it is, history, but, but that, yeah, that leaves that the fact that people have to understand the wiki to know that <laughs> there's actually something there. Because a novice would come to it and they would just see the last version and they wouldn't know that they could even click on the last the last versions. No, I I don't think that's a that would be too great. You can also not easily search uh, the history. For example, if you are looking for some particular keyword, uh huh, how you would, uh, then you need to check all the history files. I think it's not no it's not Compared the thing right right it will be very much harder to find things because for example mm -hmm. if it's in a history that eludes the search engine box there so no it, that's yes. not great um yeah we want to keep not use that feature of the wiki to to back stuff up there is a backup i mean naturally we've got a like monthly backups of the wiki and stuff so i mean we're not going to lose anything. But yeah, if it's not visible up front, it's people won't know it's there. So yeah, I, I'd say, Lex, let's just keep four, four of the last meetings up and hide everything in links like at the very bottom of the of the current development team log page. Yeah. That'll be good. Okay. Thank you. That, that will help. Um, so we officially have a uh, development maintainer, maintainer, maintainer. We've got an official OSE Linux page maintainer. We need some maintainers. We're going to need to migrate people like Abe and Roberto up to uh, maintainers of some of their, like 3D printer or PowerCube maintainers and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, yeah, we need we need maintenance on the wiki because, uh, after all, it's the maintaining that's uh, that as the project grows, it becomes the bigger part of the effort as opposed to creating new stuff because. Um, Otherwise, you just lose all that. If you don't maintain it, you just <laughs> get making a big mess, which is hard to navigate. So as we go forward, we want to cultivate maintaining ability, uh, cultivate more maintainers to take care of certain pages like Wikipedia as maintainers and editors. Yeah, actually, I have another question about the wiki. Is it possible for an administrator to rename uh, files because I'm looking at the history on the cat on that auxiliary yeah. cube? And it looks like I actually started in December. Yeah. Paste the link. It looks like that file would be ideal if I pasted the link over there. If that could be renamed, if possible, to uh, well, I, I see that you started a page called 1801 like, in uh, in January. I guess I uploaded the original file in at the beginning of December, which is when technically I should have named it uh, mm -hmm. 1712. I guess that was the mistake, but. Um, just there's a lot of stuff like it that gets named wrong and needs to be corrected sometimes, or or I guess they could redirect something. Well, but that that might be confusing too. Well, I think the idea of using the version name is the best differentiator. Like, say the the naming convention gets like way out of whack. Well, I think when we do the next version. And, ho and definitely for like so-called the last version, though I don't think there ever will be a last version. But basically, as soon as you migrate to the next iteration, then, then we can clean up the nomenclature as well. And we can make that known. So it's like, okay, from now on, we're going to name this 
like bam simpler more direct and clear and stuff like that so I, I would say that issue is resolved by getting on to the next iteration would that be all right okay yeah um i could also just upload the file to a um 1801 but yeah i mean we can leave it i could name it in the in the pages and refer to that file 17 yeah i mean auxiliary, I guess. what you can do is uh, uh yeah just if you feel strongly about renaming it to to 1801 or something like all we need to do is make sure we document like for example in a genealogy and a part library make sure the names are correct but if you feel strongly that you do have to change it well you'd have to change it in those different places um but then yeah. if you do just put a what i what i like to do is use that hint thing like if you see some pages that have that green box which is act it's a template that's activated by the double bracket hint vertical slash and like you can say for example okay we need to delete this page because so then we can you know then i can take a look at it or, or if some other editor has uh permissions to delete files then that could be done pretty yeah. much readily so we, yeah. we can have like a there is a page yeah. called deletion candidates somewhere on this wiki but because people think there's a lot of stubs but that is fine because stubs could be just basically hyperlinks that other pages use they're not be they're not going to be like full worked out pages but just like a definition i think it's useful to use stubs like that where you just for example even just defining a word you know i think that that is very useful so that so that you can have hyperlinks like that so so in general like i i don't like deleting pages because they're not expensive unless it's like a huge file on a page or something that we definitely don't need um but the wiki is a database so so basically the the point of the wiki is that you point people to the pages you want to see them you want to see and you just ignore the old stuff it just gets buried um without really hurting navigability because it's a database it's really still very quick so uh now is that scalable I don't know. It's uh, the idea with that is is that as we get more, well, it's not really ex scalable if you put a bunch of trash and keep it there. But the point is that over time, people will make little edits and improve pages, or as there's more uh, people with uh, like deletion privileges, they they do that. So so over time, the idea is that it does get better, like like Wikipedia has shown. So I think it's okay to. At at this point, if you're unsure about something, don't delete it. Just continue. And we clean it up in the future. It's kind of the general operating principle. It's like over over time, the better edits trump the shitty edits. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. The wiki's not that many gigabytes. Even I, no. saw, I don't know what the growth curve is now for adding more large CAD files, but it it can't be that big, right? No, it's it's like a few gigs at this point. So we're not running into memory issues. Like if you just start a page, I mean, a page is just a few k. You know, just a little bit of text so it's so it's efficient in that sense the thing that starts to kill you is if you start putting up a lot of heavy files where uh, probably like as we scale we might need to do something about large files but for now we're not we're not really running into those well, limits yet I don't know what the hosting but for a lot of these free cat files that are larger all these documents that are very similar since the files are virtually the same from one version to the next there should be compression or deduplication on the server that that eliminates most of that too yeah yeah we could look at strategies for doing that um and of course like definitely for for some projects when there is now this is the ultimate version that we officially accept then we can say oh well all this stuff was you know a lot of the previous files like in even in a version history you know the maintainers could take a look at it oh yeah that's that's useless or whatever that's just a small change so they can actually uh, just tr start deleting a bunch of files but but for that you need proper maintainers who actually know what's in each file so that's that goes back to the maintainer issue yeah but yeah definitely i mean over time there is going to have to be a lot of deletion that happens as as you scale you just don't want to have a bunch of trash with just a little 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 bunch of cream you want to keep deleting that all the old stuff just for performance of the you know just everything is going to be faster and easier to maintain okay so that's that's it that's it for now 
Uh, I got to get going here. So thanks everybody. Next meeting, same time. Uh, it's going to be 2 p.m. CST Tuesday of next week. So please continue. And thanks for collaborating. Take care. See you next time. See ya. Good meeting. Bye. Bye. Bye.